Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 2-4 uh, in the middle of seed plants here. So we talked about gymnosperms last time. There's just one last thing I wanted to go through regarding gymnosperms uh, before we get to the next group, uh, and that is life cycle, specifically talking about the conifer life cycle. So uh, again, this is a haplodiplontic life cycle, so a lot of this should sound familiar, and I'm going to use a lot of terminology that I introduced last time. Uh, these next few slides are really just kind of putting everything together. So this begins, I mean it's a cycle, so there's really no beginning or ending, but for the sake of organization, let's begin here. The sporophyte, the prominent form, the mature tree, has male strobili, remember strobili or cones, uh, that produce the male gametophyte. Remember the male gametophyte is pollen uh, on this tree. You also have female strobili, uh, these looking cones, that produce female gametophytes, something called an ovule. So, okay, here's my summary. Sporophyte, male strobili produce male gametophytes, female strobili produce female gametophytes. And again, these are housed on the sporophyte on the tree. Uh, from here, pollen, uh, the male gametophyte, is dispersed by wind. The female gametophyte's not going anywhere, but the pollen is dispersed by the wind. We know what that looks like <laughs> living in here, here in Louisiana, uh, what this can look like in certain months of the year. Uh, pollen that manages to reach the female cone, a lot of it will not. The pollen that manages to, to reach the female cone uh, develops a pollen tube and delivers sperm to fertilize the egg. So here's a, a zoom in of what look, this looks like. There's the pollen grain, there's the pollen tube, there's the sperm traveling down the tube. To the, to the egg, egg plus sperm equals zygote, uh, and from there the zygote develops into an embryo, again going back to the sporophyte stage of things, uh, diploid within the seed. And I showed this figure before, uh, there, you know, here's the, the pine seed here, this is the sporophyte, this is the embryo growing uh, within this seed. The seeds are then dispersed, usually in the form of a pine cone, uh, and can grow into another tree. So like I said, kind of painless, a summary of a lot of stuff we talked about so far, but that's the, the conifer life cycle. All right, we are now ready to talk about the, the final group of plants, angiosperms. So back to this figure, angiosperms. So these are seed plants. They are also vascular plants, they are also land plants, and uh, of course they're plants. Uh, so the evolutionary innovation that angiosperms have that gymnosperms do not have is fruit and flowers. So uh, let's start with flowers, all sorts of different sizes and, and beautiful colors and arrangements of, uh, of things. Uh, but what's going on, I mean, we know what flowers look like, but what is actually going on in a flower? Well, the purpose of the flower is to house male and or female gametophytes. So we had cones and gymnosperms, here we, we have flowers. So here's an example of a flower housing both uh, male and female gametophytes. And the purpose of the flower, something the flower could do that the cones couldn't do, is these flowers in all their beautiful colors uh, can attract pollinators. So flowers house male and or female gametophytes. They can attract pollinators to aid in pollination. Um, pollination, defined in the key terms, the transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma. That'll make sense in a few minutes. Uh, but basically this is, this seems like a small thing, but this is huge. The gymnosperm strategy was just to release a bunch of pollen and hope that it makes it to the right place on a female cone. Uh, having pollinators assist in moving this pollen from the flower of one individual to the flower of usually a different individual, a different plant, is, is huge. You waste way less energy releasing a ton of pollen, you're much more likely to be successful, and it allows you to really mix things up genetically uh, to, to have this, this aid of a directed movement 
of your genetic material from one individual to another. And this, this ability to attract pollinators, to do pollination, has made angiosperms in specific the dominant plants in most terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, more angiosperms in most e ecosystems than, than any other type of plant. So yeah, this is the secret to their success. Um, the other evolutionary innovation here is fruit, uh, also coming in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, and you know, despite all of these being you know sweet, delicious, juicy fruits, uh, as we will see in later chapters, they don't have to be delicious and, and fruity and sweet. But this is a structure that we see on angiosperms that we, we don't see in any other plants. So let's get into a little bit more detail with things now. So flower anatomy. Um, the, there are leaves uh, here at the base of the flower called sepals. Uh, collectively they're called the calyx. So this is going to seem like a ton of terminology. Trust me, I am omitting a lot of stuff, so this is not nearly as complicated as it could be. Uh, sepals are leaves. Uh, all of these sepals together are called the calyx. They hold up the petals of the flower. Uh, collectively, the petals are referred to as the corolla. So, you know, leaves called sepals, together called the calyx, hold up petals, together called the corolla. So that's just the support structure. Uh, what's actually going on inside here? Well, one of the structures here is something called the stamen or the androecium. Uh, this is a this is a male structure. So you know, andro means male. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I guess the term android uh, refers to a machine that looks like a man. So you know, andro means male. So the androecium is the male structure, uh, also known as the stamen. Uh, just two names for the same thing. Uh, it has a filament that supports an anther, and the anther uh, is producing pollen, which as we discussed uh, are, the are the male gametophytes. So the male sex organ within the flower is the androecium, also known as the stamen. It's got an anther that makes pollen, and it's supported by a filament. The female uh, structure here is a little bit more complicated. So here in the in the center here, it's called the gynoecium, also known as the carpal, also known as the pistil. I, I don't make up these names. I'm sorry, has so many names. Uh, gynoecium at least is is easy enough to remember. Andro means male. Gyno means female. You think of like a gynecology or a gynecologist that's female reproductive anatomy, female is gyno. So the gynoecium or the carpal or the pistil uh, is this female sex organ in the plant. Um, you have a stigma at the top. It's sticky. It uh, traps pollen. Uh, from there, the pollen tube can travel down the style and finally down to the ovary, which houses the ovules. That's where the eggs are going to be, where fertilization can occur. Um, so female sex organ is the gynoecium, aka the carpal. Stigma is sticky and traps pollen. The style allows the pollen tube to connect to the ovary, which houses the ovule or ovules. So again, depending on the species, there can be one, there could be multiple. And uh, pistil, uh, technically, you know, it could be um, interchangeable with carpal. Uh, technically, the pistil refers to all the carpals within a flower. So the pistil is, is one or more carpals. In, in, in this case, there's just one, but uh, again, different flowers. Uh, can can do things differently. And in this uh, particular example, we have both of these, the gynoecium and the androecium within a single flower. Uh, this isn't always the case. When this is the case, it's called a perfect flower. So a perfect flower has both a gynoecium and uh, an androecium. So here's uh, another example of perfect flowers. Here's a you know cartoon plant. Uh, it's got the gynoecium, the androecium. It's got both of these perfect flowers. But that's not the only way to do it. You can also have unisexual flowers that have only one. 
So here is a unisexual flower that only has the male reproductive organs. It's called a staminate flower. And here is a flower that only has the female reproductive organ. This is called a carpellate or a pistillate uh, flower. So there's unisexual flower has only one of these. It's either staminate, male only, or carpellate slash pistillate. Either one of these is applicable, uh, refers to a flower that only has female. And to, to layer this on top of things, these are the terms from before, monoecious and dioecious. So uh, you can have a monoecious plant with perfect flowers or a monoecious plant where they're separated into these unisexual flowers, or you can have a dioecious plant, which of course only has unisexual flowers, female plant, only female reproductive organs in the flower, male plant, only male reproductive organs in, in its flower. So these are all the different possibilities of, of flower sexuality. And so let's talk a little bit more about fruit just briefly. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, we typically think of fruit as being, you know, fleshy and, and, uh, and, and filled with sugar and wet, uh, but it can be dry as well. Either way, the purpose of the fruit is to somehow aid in dispersal. So, you know, juicy, delicious fruit, usually the reason this exists is to tempt some uh, some animal into eating the fruit and pooping out the seeds somewhere else. Again, with the hopes that the fruit will be crushed up, uh, but the seed, which actually, the seed is the part that actually houses the, the baby plant, the embryo, the sporophyte, will be excreted somewhere else and, and will, will be far away from the parent and dispersed somewhere. But you know, you can have a, a dry fruit as well. Here's the dandelion head. Uh, there's a seed inside here. This structure, the little puffball, is technically fruit. Uh, because it surrounds the seed. And in these uh, these stickers, these burrs, there's a seed inside of there. Uh, and this is technically thin, dry fruit around the seed. And, and both of these, whether it's you know blowing on the wind or sticking to fur or clothing or whatever, uh, these aid in dispersal. And coconuts uh, and, and some other plants actually use water as a means for dispersal. But you know, whatever form the fruit ends up taking, this is its purpose to, to in some way try to aid in dispersal of the seed within. Okay, life cycle. So we talked about a conifer life cycle. What about the angiosperm life cycle? Um, whoa, this looks complicated, but actually it, it's everything that we've already talked about. It's about, you know, releasing pollen. It's about, you know, pollen tube. It's about delivering sperm down to the, the ovule down here. Uh, you know, development, all, all this stuff seems highly detailed, but it's stuff we've already talked about. Uh, there's only one thing that I think needs to be looked at more closely because there is something going on here specifically in this fertilization that is different from what we saw with previous groups. So the angiosperm life cycle, I'm just going to say similar to gymnosperms, the same one, two, three, four, you know, whatever we talked about. The biggest difference, there is what's called a double fertilization event. So there's a pollen grain, stigma, style, ovary, pollen grain, makes a pollen tube, sends sperm down, count them, one, two sperm going down there. One of them is going to fertilize the egg. The other is going to fertilize what's called the polar nuclei. So here's another figure showing this maybe a little bit more clearly. Two sperm going in there, one fertilizes the egg. So you know, the egg and sperm are haploid, 1n, one, 1 plus 1 is 2. You know, egg plus sperm equals diploid zygote. This is going to grow up to be the plant, the sporophyte. The polar nuclei, each one of these, this is a single cell with two haploid nuclei. Once the sperm fertilizes the polar nuclei, all three of these are going to combine to form a cell that is triploid. <laughs> three n three copies of each chromosome this is called the endosperm and it is going to grow 
it is going to divide. It is not going to be part of the plant. It is not going to have leaves or roots or anything like that. The purpose of this triploid endosperm is purely to serve as a fuel for this growing sporophyte. And, you know, depending on the plant, you know, some of the endos in some plants, most of the endosperm is, you know, spent during development. Some plants hold on to a lot of this, trying to fuel germination. Uh, but yeah, there's a double fertilization here to create this endosperm, uh, the job of which is, is simply to fuel the growth of the zygote. So, okay, to summarize this, here's double fertilization. Sperm plus egg equals zygote, but also sperm plus polar nuclei cell equals endosperm, a, tri a triploid 3N structure, and this endosperm uh, serves as a food reserve for the embryo. All right, now that we've talked about their anatomy and their reproduction, uh, let's talk about groups. So as it turns out, there are three main groups of angiosperms, uh, the first of which is a group called basal angiosperms. And uh, th this is a relatively small group. Uh, there are only a few notable members, uh, including, you know, kind of a grab bag of different things. Uh, you know, what holds these together is, is really an evolutionary relationship. There's nothing obviously physical uh, about the relationship between these. Um, this includes water lily, magnolias, uh, black pepper, and a spice bush. Um, yeah, so basal angiosperms, you should, you should know these three, magnolias, laurels, black pepper, and water lilies. Uh, it, is a, it is a relatively small group and, and there's really not much to say about them. Their, their distinguishing feature is that they're not members of the other two groups. <laughs> so anyway, what are the other two groups? Well, the other two groups are, uh, and I'm gonna say these side by side, uh, dicots and monocots, or, or technically it's eudicots and monocots. So eudicots, uh, include most trees and, oddly enough, cabbages. Uh, monocots include grasses and palm trees. So here's just you know, a summary here. Monocot, just looking at crops here, uh, rice, wheat, bananas, eudicots, cabbage, beans, peaches, and, you know, and other fruit trees. Um, the best way to think about these two groups, eudicots and monocots, is monocots are grasses. I mean, palm trees are kind of a weird exception to this, but if it, if it has blades that look like grass, whether this is rice or wheat or you know, any of the grass that grows in a yard or bamboo that has this type of leaf that's straight like that, uh, those are monocots. When you hear monocot, you should think grasses, uh, eudicots, uh, pretty much everything else. So if, if you want a, a more thorough breakdown, uh, don't memorize this table, but uh, this is showing that there are a lot of differences here. Here's a, a different table that's perhaps a, a little bit more visual. Uh, there are only a few of these that I think are, are very important to, to focus on. And uh, I've summarized the table here, monocots versus eudicots. So these are, in my opinion, the, the three big things you should be familiar with. They get their name, the, the cot uh, in their name, from a structure called a cotyledon. Uh, a cotyledon is defined in the key terms as a primitive leaf that develops in the zygote. Uh, so mono means one, monocots have one cotyledon, uh, eudicots have two, two cotyledons. So this has to do with the overall sort of grass shape of things. Uh, so monocots, if you think of a blade of, of grass emerging from a kernel of corn, uh, that, that's going to be one cotyledon, and you can even see this in the seed. Two cotyledons, which you can see if you ever watch a bean germinate, uh, two cotyledons uh, is, is the eudicot way uh, of things. So one cotyledon versus two. Another uh, thing that's you know, readily apparent just looking at them from the outside has to do with the way their, their veins are arranged on the leaf. So I said a, a minute ago, 
you should think of monocots as grasses. It's because their, their leaves the, or the veins in their leaves run parallel to one another. So these veins going in lines along the blade of grass, along this blade-like leaf. Uh, in contrast, in eudicots, the veins sort of spread out in sort of a, a veiny net. You could really see this in the cabbage leaves. Uh, and, you know, most trees that have fruit and flowers have leaves like this as well, whether it's an oak tree or a maple tree or, or what have you. So grasses with the grass blades are monocots and the, the sort of vein-like leaves that are net-like, that's a eudicot thing. And the third feature will become more apparent when we get into the next chapter because it has to do with the details of that vascular tissue. Uh, monocots are going to have scattered vascular bundles scattered throughout the stem and eudicots, it's going to be arranged around the outside. Again, Come back to this idea, it'll make sense before the exam because we'll, we'll get into this in, in just the next chapter. So, okay, uh, that we're finished with uh, you know these major groups of plants. There's a, a little section here before the end of this chapter just talking about seed plants just kind of in general, their role. So uh, I, I'm skipping uh, you know, a, a lot of this, uh, but just to just uh, highlight some of the important things from the textbook. Uh, one interesting point is angiosperms in specific have experienced co-evolution with herbivores. So herbivores being animals that are trying to eat them and angiosperms being plants that don't want to get eaten. Uh, so angiosperms have evolved a lot of different defenses against herbivory, trying to not get eaten. Uh, these include physical protection, you know, thorns that we see in a lot of uh, plants, trying to discourage herbivores from chomping on them. Uh, chemical compounds, here's foxglove, which makes digitalis a, a very potent toxin, uh, trying to discourage herbivores from eating them. Uh, even camouflage. Uh, these plants looking a lot like the stones found in their environment, trying to avoid looking plant-like and delicious uh, as a way to, to not get eaten, uh, mimicking uh, their surroundings. So all of these are defenses against herbivory uh, that angiosperms have experienced in response to this selective pressure from herbivores. Um, but, it, but it's not always an antagonistic type of co-evolution. I mentioned pollination earlier. Angiosperms have also uh, experienced coevolution as a means to encourage pollination. So they they do their best to try to attract pollinators. Uh, they provide nectar within the flower to incentivize these pollinators to get in there, get some pollen stuck to their bodies, and deliver that to another plant. And a lot of times, flowers have very specific shapes uh, because they're meant to attract very specific pollinators. Like a, a bee wouldn't be able to get inside this sort of tube-shaped flower angled in this way, but a hummingbird, it, it's it's built it's built perfectly for them, and that's that's coevolution for you. And you know, we we think of bees as pollinators, but there are moths that are pollinators, there are birds that are pollinators, there are bats that are important pollinators as well. Uh, and so the colors of flowers are built to attract the visual senses of a lot, you know, their specific pollinators. Um, a lot of times odor and flower shape, you know, all of these things have evolved uh, alongside these pollinators so they can work together effectively. So uh, and to encourage pollination, attract pollinators with nectar in the flower and attract them with some sort of odor or some sort of color that they can detect in the, in the flower and a specific shape to make it convenient for them as well. This is also uh, co-evolution in a positive way. And <laughs> the textbook has a section about angiosperms used by humans, but man, this goes without saying that we eat a lot of angiosperms and we use them for decorations and we build stuff out of their wood. I have a slide for this, but yeah, I really don't need to, to tell you that these are important in our lives in, in a lot of different ways. Okay, so 
Plants uh, are so, so big uh, that we don't just have a couple of chapters about you know, going through the different groups. We now have a chapter specifically dedicated to their physiology, how they work, how they behave. We, we didn't do this with protists or fungi or bacteria, but we're getting into this level of detail with plants and we'll do this with animals as well. So let's start by talking about the plant body in uh, a, really, a really broad sense. So in a very broad sense, you can separate uh, a, a vascular plant, we're, we're focusing on vascular plants here, uh, into two basic parts, the shoot system and the root system. Uh, typically, the root system is the part that's underground and you know, includes the roots. The shoot system is the part that's above ground and it includes uh, leaves and reproductive organs. So you know, two organ systems in these plants. The above ground shoot system, it does photosynthesis with leaves, it houses reproductive organs, you know, flowers, uh, and then the fruits that they produce. Uh, leaves, stems, fruits, flowers, all this stuff is part of the shoot system. The root system, in contrast, is below ground. It absorbs water and mineral nutrients from the surroundings, and yeah, the, the root system includes the roots. Again, we're, we're being really broad here. So uh, if we want to get into more detail, though, we can look at plants in terms of tissue types. So there are going to be four types of tissue found throughout the plant in, in the root and in the shoot system. Uh, the first of these I want to talk about is something called meristematic tissue. So here's a sort of overview of a generic plant body. Uh, if we want to look for the, the meristems, the meristematic tissue, you're going to find this primarily at the sites of active growth. So here's some meristems at the tip of the shoot, and here are some meristem cells uh, near the tip of the root. These meristem cells um, are similar to the stem cells found in animals, if you're familiar with stem cells at all. Uh, these are the cells that are actively dividing. No other cells in the plant uh, have permission to divide. Every other type of cell or, or tissue is doing a job, you know, transporting nutrients or absorbing water or doing photosynthesis. Uh, the only cells that divide and make more of themselves are uh, cells within this meristematic tissue. Uh, within meristem tissue, there are three types. Uh, the apical meristems are the ones we just saw in that figure, the ones uh, in the shoot and in the root called apical, the apical meristems that extend the plant length. This is called primary growth. Most plants are actively growing up or actively growing down, usually both at the same time. Most of the meristems are, you know, in these locations shoot apical meristems or root apical meristems. But of course, these are not the only types. I said there were three. There are also lateral meristems. These uh, grow side to side. They in increase the thickness or the girth of the plant. This is called secondary growth. So here is a, a lateral meristem. I apologize for the poor quality of this particular figure. Couldn't find a better figure. Uh, but here's some lateral meristems and in increasing the thickness of this plant. And then the third type of meristem is called intercalary meristems. Uh, and this is monocot only. So this is only found in, uh, this is you know uh, supposed to be a diagram of bamboo we're looking at here, which is a type of monocot. Intercalary meristems is, uh, are located at a point where the leaves attach to the stem to extend these leaves out from the stem. So there's the apical meristem at the tippy top of the stem, lateral meristems growing side to side, and intercalary meristems at this point right here uh, where the leaves uh, which are growing out attach to the stem. So intercalary meristems at point where leaves attach the stem to extend the leaves. And as I said, this is monocot only. Okay. So uh, you know, regardless of where it is located and, and how it's growing, all of these were meristematic tissue. They're all about growth. Uh, another type of tissue found within plants is dermal tissue. Uh, maybe you can guess this based on derm. Uh, derm, you think you know, dermatology or dermatitis. Derm means skin. 
And yep, dermal tissue is the, the skin of the plant. Uh, and it's, it's found everywhere. So obviously there's dermal tissue on the outer layer of the leaves, uh, the outer layer of the stems. Uh, it's the D here. Uh, also in the outer layer of the roots. So surrounding the entire plant, that's where you'll find dermal tissue covers and protects the plant. Uh, all plants have a structure called the epidermis. Um, key term is defined this as a single layer of cells found in plant dermal tissue covers and protects underlying tissue. Um, there's something important in that definition, single layer of cells. Uh, and yeah, if we look back at this, yeah, look at this D, that's, that's one layer of cells. And that's kind of weird to us because when we look at animal uh, tissue, dermal tissue that fulfills the same function. We have lots and lots of layers of cells protecting our outer skin, for example, but in plants, just a single layer of dermal tissue protecting all the other fun stuff inside. So all plants have this epidermis. Some plants, in addition, have something called bark. Key terms define this as tough, waterproof outer epidermal layer of cork cells. These are typically dead, just adding some extra protection to this uh, single layer of living uh, tissue on the outside. Now, dermal tissue uh, in and of itself is not very exciting. It's kind of boring. It's just this outer layer of cells, uh, but we can get into things that are kind of exciting uh, if we talk about specialized cells of the dermal tissue. So, we don't often think about this, but plants need to breathe. Uh, they don't have lungs pumping air in and out like, uh, like we do, uh, but they need to be able to exchange gases. So if you want to exchange gases with the outside world, you're going to need openings. You're going to need a mouth. You're going to need pores. Uh, and so as great as the dermal tissue is at providing protection, you're going to need an opening where gases can enter and escape. Uh, these openings are called stomata and they are carefully guarded by specialized cells of the dermal tissue called, appropriately, guard cells. Uh, so these paired kind of sausage looking cells uh, line the stomata or stoma. Stoma and stomata are the same thing, uh, just used interchangeably. They line these openings uh, and by manipulating the, the pressure of the water in these guard cells, they can open or close. You know, at different temperatures or times of day or conditions, the plant may want these things to be open or closed. And this can be controlled by these guard cells, which are a special type of dermal tissue. So in leaves, there are openings called stomata that allow for gas exchange, again, getting CO2 and getting rid of O2. Uh, specialized cells called guard cells line stomata and control their opening. So simple enough, but more exciting than just being the outer layer of things. Another more interesting example of dermal tissue are structures called trichomes. Uh, these are, they look like fuzzy hairs. Uh, they fulfill a couple of purposes. Uh, they provide just some, you know, shade and protection the same way that, you know, hair on, uh, on a mammal body would. Uh, but a lot of these trichomes are actually tipped with microscopic little beads containing toxins or poisons or foul tasting substances. Um, Maybe this looks familiar to you. This is a marijuana plant we're looking at here, uh, and its trichomes definitely have uh, quote-unquote toxic substances uh, in them to try to discourage herbivores. So this is technically part of the dermal tissue, but yeah, it's a, it's a much more interesting function than just being the outermost layer of cells. So in summary, Trichomes, again, a type of dermal tissue. Trichomes are hair-like structures that can prevent water loss and or store toxic compounds to discourage herbivores. Uh, and, oops, I skipped ahead here. Uh, root hairs are another type of specialized dermal tissue. Root hairs are, I mean, exactly what they sound like, uh, extensions of the root. Uh, they increase surface area for absorption. Uh, again, the point of the root is to absorb stuff from the surrounding environment, and having all these root hairs here increases the, the surface area of the root to do a better job at absorbing stuff. 
All right, well, we've got two other types of tissue in plants to talk about, but this is typically where I run out of time in, uh, in this lecture in person. Uh, so this is going to be kind of an awkward, but it is the way it is, kind of an awkward cutoff for the end of lecture 2-4. We'll talk more plant physiology in the next one.